We have the honor. <laughs> yeah, don't know about that. <laughs> we have with, with us the uh, Professor Charlie Brickman. Mm -hmm. um, he is uh, an astronomer from Norway, and he is working right now at the Leiden University and in the Astrophysics Institute at Porto in Portugal. Uh, okay, he will talk about MUSE, that is a new instrument installed in the BLT telescope at Chile. And uh, so we'll let you with Professor Brickman. Welcome and thanks for this seminar. Well, thank you very much. I've been, I've been enjoying my, my stay here. Um, and I'm going to talk, so last week I think you might have heard a bit about a muse, which has nothing to do with this muse. So this is the muse. Um, now, now what I'm going to start with is this plot. So, so normally when you want to observe galaxies using spectra, what you do is you go out and you put a slit on the sky. And you let light go through a little aperture on the sky. And that's what I've done here. But of course, I hope you will think that if I was to give my talk just viewed through this slit, it would be a, quite an annoying talk because you will have to extrapolate everything else I'm showing you. So instead, what Muse does is it gets rid of these slits and it lets you see the whole talk. Okay? So what I'm going to talk about is, is work that's been done within the consortium the, that built the instrument. And I'll talk about the instrument in a second. And uh, this has been led by uh, Roland Bacon at the, uh, at the observatory in Lyon. And, but there's a big group of us in, within Europe that uh, constructed this instrument and now offer it for general use. So I'm going to start a little bit with introducing the instrument and show some examples of science outside of the galaxy evolution, which is what sort of became the main thing here. Um, and then I'm going to focus at the end on some recent, very new results on, on, on galaxy evolution. And I'll come to that later. So, but let's start with the instrument. It looks a bit like an octopus from hell. It's a large structure. Uh, all these cables here are a cooling system for the instrument to keep it stable in temperature. Um, it's installed on, on UT4, the fourth of the, f of the four... Uh, very large telescopes in Paranal. And uh, in fact, it's, uh, that telescope is part of the interferometer. So for this thing not to disturb the interferometer, the pumps that go to each of these tubes have to be slightly out of sync. So when you're inside the telescope at night and it's completely dark, it just goes tick, 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 tick. It's quite freaky. Um, now, this is an integral field spectrograph. And I think I'll start out by giving you a, a feeling. Oh, whoops, let me. I forgot that this one starts automatically. Um, let me go back a second. I'm going to... Ah, so I'm going to take you a tour of following some light going through the instrument. So this is now a bit of sky that's coming through this light ray. And what this instrument does is it, it takes that light and passes it through. So it first goes in through the, f the, f the first part of the aperture. And then it does one reflection, comes back again, has another reflection, and it slightly distorts the shape. And then it goes through what's called a field splitter, which splits the light into multiple streams that then hits an array of mirrors. And you see, these are all tilted slightly differently. So light is reflected there and then sent into one of 24 different spectrographs. So what we have is 24 different spectrographs that basically slices the, the sky into 24 bits. I okay. don't know why that went completely black, but I didn't have anything more to say about it, so that's okay. Um, so in the language of, of computer vision, this is called the hyperspectral imager. But for us, it's a, it's a spectrograph. It basically, and this is, I think, is the, is the bit where, where this instrument is really transformational or completely revolutionizes the approach we take to getting spectra of objects in the sky. 
it's that this one gives you a spectrum everywhere you look. So you do pixel spectroscopy because the pixels here are 0.2 by 0.2 arc seconds. On the seeing of a telescope is typically worse than 0.6. So you sample and you take basically an image, but instead of taking an image in one filter, you're now taking an image in 3,600 wavelength bins, right? So you get a spectrum of every single pixel in the sky. And that really is revolutionary. Previously, we were never close to this. We took perhaps big boxes that are almost an order of magnitude larger than this. And then you don't take an image, you take some really blurred, fuzzy view of the universe. And so that's really the, really the noticeable thing about it. This is the wavelength range and the resolution, none of which are particularly exciting. Um, but they are, of course, important. So this is where it's looking. It's on the Naismith focus of the VLT. It uh, fills the Naismith focus completely. The platform is completely full. And if you want to do something, you have to be very careful. Each spectrograph can be taken out here, pulled out. Despite all the chaos, it's actually possible to pull them out. But they weigh about 100 kilos, and they cost hundreds of thousands of euros, so you don't want to drop them. OK, so let me just show you what it can do to start with, on things that are not galaxies, this to begin with. Um, so this is from the first light. First light for this instrument was in January 2015. And it became ready for use about one year ago. So about one year ago, I spent, I spent with some of the other, with the other team, we had the last sort of commissioning of the instrument uh, in Paranal and uh, became ready for general use in October last year. So here, here is uh, Saturn. This is the spectrum of all the pixels taken together. This is an image just made from Muse data. So now let's just zoom in on the methane feature. The methane feature is here. And then we can just make an image of this only. And what you see is that the planet disappears. And it disappears, of course, because methane absorption happens in the atmosphere. And the rings only show you reflected sunlight. So what you get here is the spectrum of the sun. What you get here is the actual atmosphere. Okay? And then you can do this with all the various things. You can, get a, you can map it out. For Saturn, this is not so exciting. I mean, people have looked at <laughs> it. It's still a nice result to do. But people could do this with other techniques. So, um, the next thing people did was they did Jupiter, because they realized there was a passage of Europa in front of Jupiter. Here's the shadow of Europa here. And this is now, again, one of the colors here. The red here is methane. And they took a lot of exposures of it, and they created a movie. So now it's just an image, but imagine every single pixel you see on this image is a spectrum. So you can actually do, you know, complex chemistry in here, everywhere you want to do, just using these data. And that was 108 images taken about a tenth of a second each. So this is quite a short amount of, of time. So that's what it did in the, in the solar system. If we go a little bit further away, the next place we focused on, and this is, this is the, the previous two haven't been published. I don't think the data are quite good enough for publishing. But um, this has recently been published. This is a map of the Orion Nebula, part of uh, the Orion Nebula. And this is not an HST image. This is an image using Muse, where we created a color image using three different regions in wavelength space, somewhere around 5,300 angstrom to get the stars. There are no emission lines there. And then two sets of emission lines in here, just to map out the various regions, the southern bar, um, you can see various, well, not in this particular figure, but maybe in another one, you can see her big Haru object, you can see the whole thing. This is five by six arc, sec arc minutes on the sky. And it was quite a quick thing to do. You just do doom, 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 and then you spend half a year reducing the data. But observing it is quite quick. So here is another view labeled. Now you can actually see these things. It's exactly the same data, done nothing else. Remember, there is, this is a data cube. So there's a third dimension that you don't see. Instead here, now we use sulfur 2, nitrogen 2, and H beta, just to create this image. And now what stands out very clearly are jets from Herbig Haru objects in the southern region. You can see the bright bar, which is very bright in sulfur 2. That was known 
long before. And you can see it, a subtle set of, of uh, ionized structure all over the cluster. And what I don't show here, but you know the wavelength position of every single line here. So you can map out the velocity structure everywhere on 0.2 arc second scales. And if you have a good reason to do this, this is not that hard to do. Okay? The, 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 the reduction pipeline, everything is there. If you have the idea on how to do it, this is a few hours of observation on, on the VLT. Okay. This, is the, this is the second largest data set we have. Um, it's, uh, it's about 100 gigabytes, this data cube. It's one single cube. Um, and uh, we have a larger one, which I'm currently reducing, of, of the Trifid Nebula, which is 11 by 11 arc minutes, which will be of the order of 300 gigabytes if I ever were to put it in a cube, which I probably will not. Um, and, uh, but this, this kind of thing is going to be routine in the years from now on. This was commissioning data. This was, this was only taken a week after the, tele the instrument was put on the telescope. So it's quite a remarkable data set for that. And this is what it looks like when you take a spectrum, just extract a single pixel and uh, look at what the spectrum looks like. I think there are multiple pixels here. There's some data reduction features that haven't been taken out, but otherwise you can see a very rich set of passion lines. You can see the, all the forbidden lines in the optical region. There's a wealth of information there that we have only started scratching the surface of. And this data set is publicly available. You can download it and uh, use it for whatever science you want to do. Okay. That's a common thing we have for all the commissioning data we have. So just to show you, this is the same data again, but now using only lines from hydrogen. And this is then used to map out dust in, this, in the nebula. And where it's redder here, it has more dust. And the last one I'll skip over. So the, the last one I'm going to do touch on before I move on to galaxies is global clusters. So there's another thing that MUSE is fantastic for, and that really is compact stellar systems. So here is a MUSE image of a center of one global cluster. His name I forgot, so I'm going to move to the next slide because there it is. NGC 6397. Of course, I couldn't remember that. So we took this again during commissioning time, and we created a mosaic. There were some observational issues, so there were two bits that didn't satisfy the quality we needed. But this is basically the grid that's taken. Now, the, the, the truly amazing thing about this is that it's now possible to take HS, there are HST images of this. It's a very high spatial resolution. You know where all the stars are really well from HST. So you can use that in combination with these data to get out the spectrum of every single star. In this, from this data set, we got spectra of high quality spectra for about 20,000 stars. Right? And so that's, that's pretty much as many stars as people ever managed to get out for global clusters analysis. And, and you can do really well. I mean, you, by knowing this as a prior, you can actually even extract things that are so close you can't see them separate. Okay? That's more in the, there's a, the details of this particular process is in a paper by Husser et al., which has been submitted. I don't know what the process is, procedure, where it is in the process of publishing. Um, now, the cool thing about this is that you can then calculate stellar parameters for all stars. And so that then you have a single to noise cut, so you only use the good quality data. And that's what you see here. So this is a Hertzsprung Russell diagram. Normally, what people will plot for this is a color magnitude diagram. Right? They will plot color and magnitude because that's what you can do. Here, we have spectra for each one, so we can analyze each spectrum, and we can derive effective temperature, metallicity, and surface gravity. Well, at the moment, the surface gravity, for technical reasons, we get to use combined with, for, by using photometry as well as the spectra. But, uh, but all these ones are spectrometrically um, determined. And then you can plot them on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, and you can see the nice turnoff, of course. You can see the, the main features, a little bit of a horizontal branch. And you can see, rather interestingly, there's actually metallicity variation. Okay? Perhaps you would think, oh, well, there could be metallicity variation here. But then why is there metallicity variation on the red giant branch? These stars should be pretty much the same age. There's a very sharp turnoff here. So these stars should more or less be the same age. But here, 
is suddenly you go up in metallicity and you go down again. So, so that seems very strange. And, and has been observed elsewhere. People have actually seen these kind of features, but very tentatively. People have never seen anything like this before because nobody had the kind of data. But there people have made the claim that there is variation in metallicity here. And it's thought to be due to selective diffusion in the atmosphere. And so then it depends on how you do the estimates of your, of your metal abundance. And that is, is a tricky, it's a tricky estimate. You might mean that what we call Fe of H might not be truly the iron abundance of the star as a whole. There might be something in the atmosphere that gives you a biased view of the star. So that's something that needs to be understood a lot more in the future. The other thing you can do with this is you can look at the, the, kin, the kinematics of each star. Okay? Because you have the velocity information along the line of sight, you can study how the stars move. And so Sebastian Kaman has been leading that. I uh, hope that paper will come out not too long. And um, he basically studied as a function of the radius in the cluster, what's the velocity dispersion. Okay? And the, the reason why you do that, of course, is that if you have a distribution of stars, well, well if it's centrally concentrated, the, the, the velocity dispersion will always increase a bit inwards. But if you put a black hole in the center, it will increase much more rapidly in the very central part. And that's very interesting because we're still not sure whether there are intermediate mass black holes in the center of globular clusters. So by using this kind of data where you have uniform data over a large range in radius, you can start placing constraints. And so what Sebastian's results are, basically these, this is the kinematic points, and these are different curves for different central, central masses. Okay. And so what he is arguing is that the data are not consistent with a zero mass central point, that there is some central concentration of mass must be there. But we cannot say whether it's a black hole or it's a compact cluster of stars. We do not go far enough in in radius. It means if you really push this really far in, in principle you can say whether it's a black hole or it's a central compact cluster of stars. With our data we cannot say that. If you assume it's a black hole, the current best estimate we have is for something that's a few hundred solar masses. But this is, I would say, very tentative. Maybe if we find this result in 10, 15 different clusters, we might believe it. But at the current stage, I would say it's tentative. But we will be doing this for, for tens of global clusters. This is, this is a few hours of observing time to do that. Yeah? yeah. No, sure, of course. Yeah. By selecting a given absorption line and is observing a given spectral type and that way clean a little bit the center of the cluster. Uh, that's an interesting question. So, so that's actually, it probably would be possible if we had a better spectral resolution. So most of the really diagnostic lines in these, so, well first you could easily do it if you were looking at things like O and B stars because they have very sharp uh, helium absorption lines, which no other stars have. Uh, but there are no O and B stars in this cluster, of course. And so most of the others have such rich absorption features spectrum that if you wanted to do that, you need to, uh, you need to have higher spectral resolution. So at the moment, the, f the diagnostic features will be a bit blended. So in principle, yes, but not in practice with this instrument. So what we can do, though, which is very related to what you're doing, is that what you're asking about is that you can subtract the stars, and then you can look at what's left. And you can look at what's left, and that's... And you, if you have something behind the cluster, you can actually look at the light as it travels through the cluster, and you can look whether there is gas in the global cluster. And we're trying to do that, and it's a bit hard, but it's, uh, it's in principle possible. So the idea, yes, it's definitely possible, but, uh, but, uh, but in this particular case, no, no chance. All right, so that's, so that's really, um, I'm not going to talk more about these, these topics, but I'm happy if you, if you want to ask me about them. I'm, of course, very happy to talk about it. Um, 
And I'm not going to talk about all the stuff that we've done with galaxies. I'm going to skip very quickly through a few things now, because um, I, uh, I had planned to remove a few slides before the talk, and then I got here just from lunch. So <laughs> I'll uh, just skip over the slides instead of, uh, instead of deleting them. Um, so the reason why Muse was built to start with, and one of the main reasons was that people were interested in looking at diffuse gas between galaxies. So they wanted to look at fluorescent emission. So when you shine, if you have a source with strong UV radiation and you have neutral hydrogen cloud, typically hydrogen is what you're going to have, then that UV radiation will light up your cloud. And so that cloud won't shine on its own. There's no stars inside it. It's just gas. And it's very hard to observe hydrogen gas at cos really cosmological distances. And so what you want is you want this UV light to shine up and create the fluorescent emission. And uh, I think it's a bit too dark to really see, but here you can see this is the distribution of hydrogen. But a lot of that hydrogen is going to be ionized in the universe. And this is the distribution of atomic hydrogen, and that's really what you want to try to map. And you see, if you can map it, you can actually trace the structure, the filamentary structure of the cosmos. And there's no other way of really doing that with current instrumentation. So that's one of the reasons why um, we really wanted to do this. And, and this is what happens when you have this atomic hydrogen, but you turn on galaxies and you shine UV light on them. And then they light up like this. And this is the kind of structure we're looking for by doing very, very deep observations of the sky. We used to try to find this, this structure and find these filaments. This, we are nowhere near doing that at the moment. We need to understand our data reduction better. We need to integrate for much longer. In order to detect this, we need to stare at the same point of the sky for about 100 hours. So that's quite a long exposure time. And you don't do that until you really understand how you reduce your data. But we did a good attempt. Um, so when I was there last summer, we observed a field called the Hubble Deep Field South. So there are three deep fields by HST. There's the Hubble Deep Field North, which was a big success in the mid-90s. There was the Hubble Deep Field South, which they did around 2000, and which nobody ever did anything with, because then afterwards came the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which everybody works on. But this is a nice field, which wasn't studied very much. And what we did was we observed this region for 20 hours. I can assure you it was not very exciting. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have this telescope with an alpha uh mount. Yeah. So you have um, field rotation. Yeah. How, how did you correct ah. by, by, for field rotation? So, so to some extent you know what it is, but it isn't good enough. Oh. So, so there are two things we can do. Um, probably there are no markers here, but it doesn't really matter. I'll, I'll, I'll just explain. Um, so around the instrument, so the instrument take this image. Around this instrument here, we have a, another camera. We actually have detect light. We take a picture in a ring around, and that coupled, I mean, the telescope has a guide star, so it knows fairly well what the rotation angle is. But in addition, we have this image around here, which we can then use to say, OK, that's the rotation. And that works really quite well. Up to, up to close to what we need. <laughs> and beyond that, what we have to do is we have to take a look at the images and see exactly what's the, what's the astrometric solution. And we can do that by comparing to HST data. So we take each exposure and we compare the positions of all the objects that we can detect to the ob positions in HST. And then you can calculate what the rotation is. Yeah, yeah, you have to take that into account, yeah. So it is, it is a complicated point to do, but, uh, but we spent a lot of time doing, developing the software to do that kind of step before we went to a telescope, so we can actually do it quite, quite easily. But you have to have a lot of checks. But detecting by area is not a square, so it's, it's a simple it's a, it's, a, it's a truncated, uh, truncated sort of yeah, ring, yeah. So, and it's pretty awful, but it's good for this particular purpose. <laughs> 
So if I zoom in on this, it's a, it, like any deep image, it's kind of boring. It has a few galaxies here, a few galaxies there. Before we went to a telescope, we knew the redshift or the distances to 18 galaxies in this field. Um, from quite a lot of papers, there were you know, five different papers that all put in efforts, and that's about the total amount. Now, oh yeah, this is the, this is the basic thing. So, so it's 27 hours of integration, 30 minutes at a time. These are the depths, etc. That's not so important. Let me show you instead. Oh no, sorry. I'll ha I have to come back to the number of redshifts because I it was this deletion of slides that I was going to give. Um, but the really key thing here is that we got 190 redshifts just from this one observation run. So 10 times as many as been known in the 15 years that had gone on before. So that's very efficient. And the advantage is we didn't need to select which galaxies we wanted to observe. We didn't need to put a slit on them. We got everything. We got everything we pointed at. And the technical, so these are the sort of the, 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 the limits, etc., that we're doing, the detection limits. But this is the crucial thing when you go deep is that you need to benefit from observing more and more. And that's where the data reduction comes in. So if everything is perfect and you do your reductions right, etc., the, the noise in the image should basically decrease as one over the square root of the number of exposures. This is just propagation of errors, right? Standard propagation of errors. And so that's, that's the target. And that's the solid line that you see here. And here is the number of exposures that we combined. So we did the reduction using combining one exposure, doing combining four, eight, etc., up to the full set of exposures, um, 54. And what you can see is that we're not quite hitting that perfect target. There's something residual in our data reduction that doesn't quite allow us to get to the full depth. And that's why we're not going for 100 hours yet. We need to understand why this is. So that's what we spend a lot of time on now. And that's hard. That's a lot harder than do the data reduction. <laughs> so we have various ideas, but I'm not going to spend time on that now. OK, so this is, ah, OK, so now you're hardly, but possibly, can see where all the redshifts are that we got. And this is the, the, the summary. There are 70 galaxies that where the only thing we see is Lyman alpha. They're really distant. The redshift greater than 3. Um, 65 of them we see because they have strong oxygen 2 emission. A few we see because they have a lot of carbon 3, 1909 emission. There are eight stars here. This one obviously is a star. And the others are harder to spot. One of them is a white dwarf, which is very useful for checking our redu reductions. And some of the galaxies are galaxies where you can only see absorption lines. And those are really hard. And galaxies are clearly not very fond of being alone, because 43% of the galaxies are in groups with multiple, more than two galaxies. And 30% are in pairs. And it's only 30% in total. 28% that are isolated, where we don't see any galaxies nearby. Okay. Well, so I'm going to actually jump over some of these ones. I'm going to show you one example here, possibly. Um, mm, yeah, that's kind of difficult to see. Let me show you this one instead. OK, so this. It's an object where in the HST image you see nothing. This HST image goes to 30th magnitude. It's very deep. You see nothing here. You see nothing in the Mu's white light image when I summed over all the wavelengths. But when I look at the spectrum, it has a clear emission line here. There's nothing else, just that emission lines. And that emission line is asymmetric. And we know the only lines that typically give you as asymmetric lines in the in the normal galaxy is a Lyman alpha due to, uh, due to absorption. You absorb the blue part of the, of, the, of the line because of resonance scattering, and it escapes on the, on the red side. And when we zoom in over just over this line, I just make an image just over this line, well, suddenly this galaxy, which was invisible in the HST data, suddenly pops out. And bang, I can see it. And I can analyze it. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. 
So before I jump over some, let me just show you one other cute result. So usually well, the way it works when you look at these data is that you look at the spectrum. And only when you don't understand the spectrum do you look at the, the images. So here, I looked at this spectrum and I saw a line here and a line here. So the first thing you do is you just go in and you plug into a line list and you see which, what's the redshift, what, what works, and didn't work. Okay? There's no pair of lines that have that separation. It doesn't, just simply doesn't work. And then you look at the lines in detail, and I don't have a good zoom here, but this is alignment alpha line. It's both it's asymmetric and there's a slight dip here, which we also know is characteristic of alignment alpha. This line is a doublet, and the line separation is consistent with it being oxygen 2. But the problem is this is at 1216 angstrom. This is at 3727 angstrom. They are 2000 angstroms apart in rest frame. So you, you can't possibly get them in the same spectrum with mu's. And so then what we did was we decided to go to the image, the HST image, and we realized that this is the size of our seeing disk from the atmosphere. And here, there, this was thought to be a single object when they made the catalog with HST. But this is blue, and this is slightly different color, and they clearly belong to different things. So when you make an image over this line, it has a centroid here. You make an image over this line, it has a centroid here. So you can actually distinguish and disentangle things in three dimensions that you have absolutely no way of doing in two. So this means that they are they're separately redshifted. And, uh, and this one is a high, really high redshift galaxy. It's a, it has redshift of about 3.2. And this here has this redshift of 0 0.8. That corresponds to this line. So this, this galaxy probably has an oxygen 2 line as well, but it's going to be about here. So we don't see it. So they are... Um, so that's a good question. We don't know. I mean, it's, it's possible that this is lensed. This, this, this object is lensed by the foreground. It's possible. Uh, we have no way of saying because it's, it's completely unresolved. Now, let me jump over the slides I had planned to actually delete um, and show you a couple other things. Okay. Right, okay, so actually this is, the, this is the diagram that shows the centroids. So this is the centroid of this line. This is the white the line, image over that line, and that's the image over this line. You can see it's slightly offset. This, the red cross is in the same position. And you see the center of this black is slightly, slightly shifted. Of course, the size of this is about the size of blurring of the atmosphere. So you can't, that's why you can't do very much better than that. That's what, that's what the current situation is. So let me show you the redshift distribution just to conclude this part. So this is what we had before Muse went to the telescope. So here is redshift, and here is magnitude. And so from the ground, as a good, if you're not familiar with it, uh, if you have a four meter telescope, then you basically, you stop around here. That's about as faint as you're going to do efficiently. I mean, you can go fainter, of course, but you need a long time. With an 8, meter, eight to 10 meter telescope, you can basically stop at around 25th magnitude. Again, if you have a single object, you can hammer at it and you can go a bit fainter, but typically 25th magnitude is where most people will stop. So it means that if you wanted to go and do a spectroscopic survey, you will never put a slit on an object that's much fainter than 25th magnitude, because you know you're never going to get a redshift. Well, that's as far as we thought. This is what we got with Muse of things that we could see in HST. So here there's no slit, and what happens is that, well, we can actually get redshifts of objects at 29th magnitude. 29th magnitude is really, really faint, right? That's 100 times fainter than the kind of stopping, what people thought was the stopping point for 8-meter class telescopes. And the reason is we can see the emission lines. The emission lines are still bright, even though you can't see the galaxy. 
So this is really revolutionary. I think this is really going to change the game in many ways in what you're going to study. They're very different complementary things, but this, I think, is very powerful. The size of those are... The size of these uh, things have to do with the size of the galaxy on the sky, but uh, um, this was... My, my original version of this plot, that was what it was exactly, and then it was remade, and I used a new version, and I don't remember precisely how they are scaled. <laughs> I remember how they were scaled in my part. Is it just the trend? Yeah, no, so they are certainly smaller up here, always. Yeah, they're really dinky. So, um, and these galaxies that are up here, they are actually fainter than the limit of HST. So we cannot see them in HST data down to 30th magnitude. Um, and nobody would know that they are there if you, if you observe them. You could not observe these in any other way because you don't see them in the deepest image you have. So there's no way you can put a slit on them because you don't know they are there. So that's really quite, quite exciting. It's a bit limited what we can do with it because we don't see them in anything else. So you only see the emission line. But anyway, it's a story for another, another time. And that's the redshift distribution. And you see there's a big gap here, and that's because in this particular region, there aren't many strong emission lines, so it's very difficult to get redshifts. So I have to rely on interstellar and stellar absorption lines, and those are very faint, and it's really, really painful to get redshifts in this region. So it's... It's just because of, it's just because of the limited wavelength range we have. So when you go up in redshift, so our redshift range is from 4,600 to 9,300 angstrom. So when you come to redshift of one, your, our red cutoff is at about 4,000 angstrom. And the blue cutoff much, much bluer, of course. And here, you're basically sampling from about 1,500 angstrom to about 3,000. And so that's atomic physics, not, not galaxy evolution, which basically tells you there aren't any strong transitions in that, in that energy range. So, um, so it's only when you get to, to slightly more energetic transitions and then come out in the UV where you get strong lines again. But it's a nuisance. Okay, that's a completeness plot. It's not so important. Um, you can try to analyze the properties of these galaxies to ask yourself, are these galaxies that, that have active galactic nuclei? Are they powered by star formation? And to do that, what we do then is we create these line ratio diagrams. So nitrogen 2 over H alpha, oxygen 3 over H beta. And we know from local universe that gr the, what the region that's colored green here basically consists of galaxies that are powered by star formation. The red are galaxies that are powered by black hole accretion onto a black hole, active galactic nuclei. And the purple is a mixture of the two. Okay. That's, we know that empirically and, and from a theoretical argument as well. Um, and so what you can see with the data points here, the background colors are from a local data set from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and the data from our sample is, is in the red colors and typically they overlap the green regions. In most diagrams, in this one it's a bit of a mess, but it's actually very hard to understand. Uh, but generally it overlaps the green region which is essentially dominated by star formation. So most of these galaxies, the main energy source powering them is star, young stars, okay? not, not a black hole. Could it be, could it be this an effect, an selection effect? I mean, if we are looking for, if we are seeing the line, I mean, we are just seeing the transition. So, so they would, if they had a black hole, they would actually have very strong lines as well. But there is a selection effect because most of our galaxies are very low mass. And we know that from, from the black hole mass scaling relations that when you go down in mass, you get a much, much smaller black hole. And so these galaxies, because they're so low mass, probably have a very small black holes. And therefore, they're not going to be very powerful. And hence, we don't see them. So there is a selection effect in, in that respect. We haven't worked that out in detail, so we don't know exactly what it means. But we can do that by, I could select the galaxies in the background using exactly the same properties as our galaxies, and then you can make a one-to-one -one check. But we're working on that, actually, and that's what well, this, this plot is a starting point of doing that. Um, this is mass versus one of these line ratios, and this is this SDSS data, and there is a trend here. 
a general trend, and depending on where you select your galaxies, most galaxies in STSS are here, and most galaxies in our sample are here. So there is a clear o lack of overlap, but at the moment they look very similar to their local counterparts. Okay, so let me just move to the next one. Okay, so before I go into the final part, I just wanted to highlight one thing about how this is really is a different ball game. So here, what I've done is I've got a compilation of spectroscopic surveys of the distant universe. So redshifts greater than two. And I plotted this on the area that they survey in square degrees and the number of spectra per square degree. Okay, so if you go deeper, you get more spectra per square degree. If you do a very shallow survey, you get very few spectra per square degree. And you can see that there's a quite a distribution of different surveys. The current fanciest survey around is probably the VUDS, the VMOS Ultra Deep Survey. Um, you see they have very high density. They don't cover more than a square degree, but they have a density of almost 10,000 galaxies per square degree. So they have a big, big survey. So it's interesting then to see where well, most things cluster here. So where does Muse lie? Well, to do that, we need to zoom out a bit. And that's where our one observation, which I just showed you, lie. Okay? As we go on, we will get more and more observations. But you see, we are very far away from the area coverage of these surveys. But what we have is a much higher density by almost two orders of magnitude. So what we're doing here is that we're doing small regions of the sky, but extremely high densities of galaxies. So that opens up the possibility of looking at galaxies really nearby each other and understanding what, they, what their relationship is. So that's where this really, really shines. But I wanted to finish off um, with, uh, with... What does this with time? Oh, it just means that as, uh, as we observe, we will get more and more observations of the same time, and I, it just adds up linearly. But you have to add up for a very long time until you reach here. So, so it will move a bit, but not that much. Because this is a logarithmic axis, so, <laughs> so really yeah, far away. So what I want to close with is a paper that is currently um, under preparation by Lutz Wysotsky in Potsdam. And what he was, he, one of the things we noticed when we did this data was that quite a few of our galaxies were quite big in Lyman Alpha, but not so much in the HST images. And he was wondering what that was like. And let me just show you one example of what that looks like. So here, you can see some red squares. Those are objects with red shifts. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a little zoom past a Lyman alpha line at around redshift 3. So the redshift is here. This is spatial. And I'm just going to move in wavelength. What you're going to see here is there's going to be a buildup of a structure here. You see? And that's an extended Lyman alpha halo. There's a gas inside this region that distributed both in velocity direction and the spatial direction. So why do you care about that? Well, you care about it because you want to map gas around galaxies. There are lots of different probes we use in the local universe to find gas, but in the distant universe, we're left with basically three ways. Look for molecular gas using CO, absorption of gas along the line of sight, or emission from gas. Emission is kind of challenging, but it is the only way of doing spatially resolved maps. And so the way that works is that if you have a UV source, okay, that's the that's a source that's going to ionize your hydrogen for you. If there is no scattering, then the extent of Lyman alpha or any other hyd hydrogen Lyman, Lyman alpha is the interesting one, and the UV should be the same. Okay? The light that excites the emission in Lyman alpha comes from the UV, they are in the same place, they should have the same spatial extent. But Lyman alpha is a resonant line, has a very high optical depth, so there's a very high chance for scattering. And what happens if it scatters? Well, you, the ultraviolet photons are here, they ionize the gas, the gas recombines, emits a Lyman alpha photon, but that Lyman alpha photon will random walk out 
in the gas. As long as there is gas on the outside, it will scatter off that gas and it will spread out and diffuse out and you will get a bigger Lyman alpha halo. In that way, you can map where the gas is around these galaxies. And in the past, people have tried to do that. And it finally, the first, I think, re believable result was done by Chuck Steidel a few years ago now. So this is his UV light. And this is his Lyman alpha line light. And you can see this is much more extended than that. Now, the trick is what he had to do in order to be able to do this was that he had to add together 92 galaxies. He can't study individual galaxies. He can't say whether that galaxy has more Lyman alpha than the other. He had to combine them. So this is called stacking analysis. And what Lutz realized we can do with Muse is that you can zoom in only on the line and you have information. So here is HST, Lyman alpha, HST, Lyman alpha, etc. And this is what, this is an example of one of these. So here, the green is the HST smoothed to our spatial resolution, and the blue is the Lyman alpha on an individual object. So this is the first time we've ever been able to do this for individual objects. Before, you had to lump, lump together 100. And here is the plot of the UV light and the Lyman alpha light when you azimuthally average. And you can clearly see it's extended here. And then immediately answer, leads to the question, so how common is this? Well, it actually is quite common. So we have, out of the 28 galaxies that Lutz has analyzed in detail, 22 of them have clearly extended halos. And the advantage of having them in the, yeah, sorry? If it's large, if it is large scale clumping, if it's small scale clumping, we have no chance. So it will depend on that. And um, so that's, but hopefully with the line profile, because you also have a line profile everywhere, the combination of those might constrain small scale clumping as well. But the large scale clumping is, they will be pretty big, kiloparsec scars size. So now the advantage, the difference between a stacking analysis and this analysis is that you can look at trends and you can look whether this is more common at high or low star formation rate, for instance. This is star formation rate in a way. And this is the size of the symbol depends on the likelihood of having a, or the quality of our data essentially. And you see that they have a brighter halo when they have brighter star formation rates. That's what we expect, but it's nice to see it confirmed. But what's confusing or intriguing is that the scale length, the size of the halo, goes down as you go to higher redshift. The halos become smaller at high redshift than at low redshift, even though here the luminosities are actually are quite even higher than the surroundings. It's the scale length of the, of the ultraviolet continuum, by the way. And we think that this has to do with the size evolution of galaxies. You're looking at smaller galaxies at high redshift. And I think I'm, gonna, I'm running out of time, so I think I'll just end with this one, which compares the low redshift trend. People have done this with the HST to the high redshift trends. And what you can see, there is a, there's a similar poorly defined relationship. I don't think you would call it the correlation at the moment, but it's sort of a, some relationship. Um, and this is the size of the UV continuum, and this is the size of the Lyman alpha continuum. At low redshift, the Lyman alpha and the UV is com com quite similar. They don't have a lot of gas around. At high redshift, is a similar trend, but the halos are 10 times as large. And it's probably because they have a lot more gas around them. So I'm going to end there, but I'm going to end with a slightly different slide. I'm going to end with a take-home message, which is that if you can, don't use slits, because it only give you, give you part of the story, part of the truth. Really, by using something like an integral field unit, you can really open up and see all the details. And in the future, um, we will see a number of data sets that will produce similar things. All the data sets we are creating are available from this website. Uh, that includes both the Hubble Deep Field South and the Orion data. Um, 
We're currently undertaking a GTO survey where we have 250 nights on the VLT to get many more data sets like this. And starting next year, they're going to get an adaptive optics facility on the VLT, which will get significantly better resolution and incre significantly improved spatial resolution also uh, across the, the, the wide field of the MUSE instrument. So whenever you have a chance and you think it's interesting, MUSE is definitely an instrument that, you know, available and worthwhile thinking about. It's not an easy one to get time on, but uh, still worth the effort. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is a lot of work to reduce the data or to develop the data reduction. So that's, people like Lutz were really the people pushing that, so. I, I have a couple of questions. The one is, what does it relate, I mean, what does it compare to the, the, the characteristics of news when you look at, for example, GMOS in Germany or the instrument, the Khalifa? So, so yes, yeah, so the two are, are different. I have exactly the opposite thing. So for GMOS, the difference is that the uh, the field of view of Muse is uh, uh, more than an order of magnitude larger, uh, similar otherwise um, in terms of resolution. Uh, but Muse is also even a bit more stable. GMOS has a bit more flexibility, but it's small field of view. Uh, Khalifa is done with the the PMAS spec uh, IFU, and that has a similar field of view to Muse, but the, spectral res the spatial resolution is in linear size is, um, is, is an order of magnitude. So it's almost two orders of magnitude in terms of aerial resolution compared to Muse. So I, I, I don't think I have one here, but I have a comparison observation of the same galaxy between uh, Khalifa and this, and um, it's totally different. <laughs> Yeah, that was. It's it's a lot of people trying to work on it, and it's really painful. <laughs> it's really hard. The problem is the, the the noise. So it's easy if your noise is constant with wavelengths. It's possible to write down a you know Bayesian technique or whatever you want, and it's quite easy. Um, but because the wave the the noise is strongly wavelength dependent and there is systematic uncertainty still left in the data, it's, um, it's challenging. <laughs> so we don't have a good solution. Yeah. The, the instrument is located in the NAS, NASNIT. Yeah. Is currently occupying this? <laughs> yeah, there's nothing else fits in there anymore. <laughs> it takes 95% it takes of the space there. So uh, yeah, it's also way too big to move. So you would, you would want to, in that case, you would basically have the choice between dropping the number of, of spectrographs, and then you can do that. Then you would be either having a smaller field of view, or you would, uh, and it scales almost linearly with the number of spectrographs. But you, have it, you lose, of course, uh, depending on the instrument. It, uh, it wouldn't be a trivial job to do, because this is designed for the, for the optics of the VLT. And I don't think it scales naturally um, to other instruments um, easily because of, because of the F side, the, F, uh, the, the scaling of the optics. But um, yeah, it's, it's an instrument that really requires a lot of photons. So eight meter class telescope is kind of the limit. You don't want to go much smaller. <laughs>